All right. Okay. How you guys doing? All right. Well, you guys are lucky. I'm in a good mood because it's two to one Argentina. <laughs> and let's leave it like that until I'm done. So no grunts, no verbal cues about what's going on. Yes, I, I'm wearing my jersey because I have to. It's required by my religion, <laughs> which is football. Um, so I get to wear this jersey. And part of it is I, I was 10 years old when I was introduced to this. You know, you're very impressionable. Uh, I, Diego Maradona, and you know, soccer has been, football has been part of my life ever since, and I've been trying to talk every person I know into loving football as much as I do. So thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Wanted to share a couple of thoughts with you. First, wanted to start with, um, I'm doing a session, I forget what time, I think it's 2 we're doing a Q&A, and there's a Google Moderator page up there. That's the address if you want to take a picture of it or write it down. Um, where we're asking questions, or we can do it the old-fashioned way. Uh, through when we have the session, we will do a Q&A. But just in case you, there are questions in there that you wanted to ask, uh, we're using this kind of uh, link to do that, so that we can use Google Moderator, or we can use other things like uh, other contact information. For those of you who are on Twitter or Google Plus, I'm pretty active on Twitter and on and on Google Plus. Uh, for those of you who follow me, you see that I put a couple of pictures of the dog that was sitting next to me in first class yesterday. Um, it was an exciting trip, uh, especially when the owner got up to use the restroom. The dog just sat there and stared at me the whole time. <laughs> um, and uh, it was uh, so. Anyway, so Twitter, Google Plus, great way to keep conversations going. Uh, great way to keep hashtags going. Twitter's huge in education. Google Plus uh, has a huge following in the education space. And I also write a journal. I call it a blog, a journal on, on, on my thoughts on education, so that's there for you as well. I kind of want to start with this idea that uh, where we are in education is, is this cross between what's possible and what's impossible. And I want us all to think about what's possible and to stop thinking about things that are impossible. I come from that perspective of not only the glass half full, but I have this reality distortion field that I was born with, apparently, and that has been part of my life ever since. Uh, I am a first-generation American, born and raised in Hell's Kitchen, New York, by my mother, who came from Argentina. Um, and I am that typical student that shows up in these urban environments, especially first-generation students. I uh, uh, showed up at PS111 in, in Hell's Kitchen, and they said, welcome to PS111, and I said, que? Um, so English is my second language. Um, uh, single mother, no father. Uh, on welfare, on food stamps, all the, all the stereotypical things that we have for kids that we're dealing with in these urban situations and rural situations as well. But that was my background. And it wasn't to help today. It was the Hell's Kitchen. He's going to probably give me another mic. It was the Hell's Kitchen of the 70s and 80s. It wasn't the nice place in the world to grow up. I didn't like it very much, and I wanted and I only I saw two possibilities to get out of there. One was uh, the NBA, um, <laughs> and then the other and the other was education. And since this is as tall as I got, I decided to go with uh, education. Thank you. All right, good mic switch. All right, and he'll work on the volume there. So um, education was my way out. Graduated from high school, which wasn't the easiest thing to do back then. We had a like 40, 50 percent dropout rate. I ended up going to, uh, I, I, well, that wasn't enough, so I went to college, got my college degree, and even today there's still 13 percent of Latinos walking around with a college degree. That wasn't enough, and I went and got my master's degree, and there's like 4 percent of us that are walking around with a master's degree. So I don't like the word impossible. Um, everything is possible if you put effort into it, and I think that's where we are today in education. But for me, the most important thing and why I love coming, in, and again, thank you very much for having me here today, is because education is absolutely the most critical thing in someone's life. And, and the power that we have in education and the potential that we have with, with education is important. Not only just for the kids that we're dealing with today, but for generations to come. Because education disrupts poverty, period, right? Education is what is a silver bullet. And and not just and not just for the kids that we're dealing with with that we're dealing with today, but for generations to come, right? Because today I have two kids, 
I have a 21-year-old and a 13-year-old. And my 21-year-old, I never told her she had to go to college. She's in her third year of college. I never told her she had to go to college. She just assumed she was going to college because I went to college, because everyone around her went to college. She assumes that she's going to graduate school because I went to graduate school. She assumes I'm paying for it. <laughs> but that's a good problem to have, right? That's the problem we want. My 13-year-old has been you know, thinking about colleges since he was six. He's already taken a couple online classes. We'll talk more about that in a minute. But their expectations of what's possible in life are so different, fundamentally different than they were for me in just one generation. My, I'm actually on my way to, to Atlanta. Who's going to ISTE? All right, so you hopefully make sure you guys stop by the Google booth. Uh, well, I'll be going on to, to, to Atlanta, and I'm spending the week there because my daughter's there doing an internship at CNN. And she's already had one thing on the air. And their expectations of what's possible is so fundamentally different that I, I'm OK. They're OK with understanding that my background and their background have nothing to do with each other. That's the power, and that's the potential of education. Now, we hear education's broken. We hear we need to disrupt education. We hear all these things. And the truth is that it's not so much that education is broken, but that our economy and our world has changing before our eyes. And that's what we need to focus on. What are the skills that kids need for this future and what we need to deal with? Absolutely understand that we need to make sure that we're focused on the right things because even today, if you are a high achieving, low income student, that means you get good grades, that means you do well on tests, you still only have a 9% chance of graduating from college, right? Uh, we need to, there's 13% Latinos walking around with college degrees. I think it's 18% for African Americans. We still need to do a lot of work in this space to close that achievement gap so that we can use education to disrupt poverty. At the same time, understanding that the economy is changing, that the world is changing before our eyes. In 1973, 28% of the jobs required some kind of post-secondary education. By the time we get to 2020, more than 60% of those jobs are going to require some kind of post-secondary education. Notice I didn't say college because I don't know what that's going to look like in 10 years. But some kind of post-high school degree is absolutely critical for this new economy that we're dealing with. And, and no matter what we do, we have to make sure that we're preparing our kids with the right skills that they need for that future. Because at the end of the day, what we're trying to do in education is to prepare students to work with technologies and advancements that haven't been discovered, to solve problems that we haven't really fully defined in roles that don't exist. Easy, right? That's our job in education. That's what we're preparing our kids for, for a future that we don't know about. We're preparing them for jobs that don't exist. That's our fundamental job and what we have to do in education. Now, for most of history, this was a huge task because where you were born, the resources that you had at your disposal, the family you were born into, your proximity to libraries and your access to books were all factors that determine your academic success. All of those things were absolutely critical. How close you were to a book, how close you were to a library determined your academic success. This was true for many of us, including myself. This is the, a picture of the Columbus Library on, on 51st Street and 10th Avenue. This was our information center. Right? This is where we had to go get resources and do our book reports and go get books or look up information or find microfiche. <laughs> there's, there's people in this room who have no idea what microfiche is. <laughs> and this, this library was available to my school, every other school, every public school, every private school, Every citizen that lived in Hell's Kitchen, this was the one place that we had. This was where information was. And this was true for the, a long time, 17th century, 18th century, 19th century. This is 20th century. This is what we use as an information center. And, and, and these things would close at 5 o'clock. They weren't open on the weekend. They wouldn't have the resources that, that were available uh, to other people. This was our, our information mecca center, if you will. And so what we did is we built these 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 facilities called information transfer facilities where we took big people that had information and transferred that information to small people who had information. And we call these things schools. And this is what we did. And it was absolutely critical that we had these things because it was important to transfer that information 
from one person to another person, and we did it in groups in this sense. Today, this is what an information transfer facility looks like. It's a data center. And so what we need to do is think about how the world has shifted underneath our feet because now all the world's information is at our fingertips. And no one is freaking out about this. The world has literally shifted beneath our feet and no one is freaking out. Why does my 13-year-old's classroom look basically the same as my classroom did when I was 100 years ago when I was in seventh grade? when all the world's information is now at our fingertips? How do we restructure what learning looks like now that we have information at our fingertips? And that's where the shift is happening. It's happened really, really fast, but that's where we are today. Now, I know what lots of you are thinking. We've been talking about technology in education for a very long time. First, it was uh, motion pictures were going to revolutionize education. And then it was television was going to revolutionize education. And we've been talking about computers in education since at least the 60s. All of these things were going to revolutionize and change education forever. The, the, the greatest advancement since the printing press, right? Which, of course, you know, brought us the worksheet. So, This, this was going to be, the, this is what we've been talking about in education for a very, very long time. So what's different this time? Why is today different? Why, is, why are we at that cusp of doing things in a completely different way? I'm going to propose three things to you. First is this idea that we have all this new evidence in learning science. We have all this, this, all this information, all this research, all this data that shows us that learning is personal, that we learn in different ways, that we, we take things at different paces, that two kids learning the same subject might learn things in a very individual way. We understand that individualized learning is critical. We understand that education has to be relevant and engaging. We, we have all this information about what learning should look like and what it could look like and when it's effective. Tons and tons of research. I read, read a whole bunch of it. Money, if you read a whole bunch of it, we know that there's this, all, all this stuff around learning. And technology can help us with that because the holy grail of learning is that individualization of learning, right? The, the fact that it's relevant to me, that it's engaging to me, that I can, I can take advantage of this, that I can do things with it. That's what's critical. And we have all this information. Technology can help us with that. We have all that information available to us. That's one. Two is the way in which technology has wrapped around the core of our lives like never before. Now, we have a lot of people in this room, so I'm going to try this. How many of you have not used technology today? How many of you have not used the web today? Interesting, huh? How long did that take us? Five, six years? Do you remember we used to have to call the internet? <laughs> like literally make a phone call to the internet. And the internet was busy? <laughs> Hi, you've reached the internet. I can't talk to you right now. But if you leave me a message, I'll try to call you back later. The, the internet was busy or it was rude. It would just hang up on you. Or you'd be online, you'd finally get online, and somebody would walk into the kitchen and pick up the yellow phone on the wall and knock you off the internet. How long did that take us? Today, you are on the internet before your feet hit the ground in the morning. You're on your technology before your feet hit the ground. Again, how long did it take us? A couple of years? What was our reward for getting on the internet five, six, seven years ago, right? It was a, a bunch of pages that had words, that had links, to a whole bunch of other pages that had words, that had links. And every once in a while, someone would post a picture, and you'd get so excited, like, oh my god, there's a picture coming. I have to wait 20 minutes, but there's a picture coming. And and today, today, I've already had about five conversations about how slow the internet is. <laughs> I've watched teachers lose their minds at conferences. I watched them turn into mobs <laughs> when the internet wasn't good enough. 
I myself suffer from this disease because I, last night on the airplane, I was frustrated because the internet was slow while I'm traveling at 535 miles an hour <laughs> at 35,000 feet. That didn't take us very long, did it? I mean, if you think about it, we used to go to work to use technology. And now how many of you use your own personal devices for work? All of you do, most of you do, right? We used to go to work to use technology. I remember I, a couple years ago, my 13-year-old, who was like 10 or 11, said, w right after Thanksgiving, during the commercials and things that were going on around, around you know, ads and things, they, he, kept, he asked me, what's Cyber Monday? And I had to think about that. I'm like, oh, wait. That's a, actually that's a relatively new, new term. It's called Cyber Monday, because I had to explain to him, a long, long time ago, <laughs> we used to have to go to work to use the internet. We used to have to go to work to use technology. Cyber Monday comes from the fact that we had to wait till Monday to go use the internet at work to go shopping. <laughs> this did not take us very long, right? This is the world that we live in today. The technology has wrapped itself around the core of our lives. And if that's true for us, what does that mean for our kids who don't know that the world existed before Google, who don't know that the world existed before smartphones and tablets, who don't understand a world that doesn't exist without Wi-Fi? In cars, on airplanes, in hotels, everywhere they go, they are used to using the internet. They're, it's just part of their lives. Technology is part of their lives. In the same way that all of you expected to walk in here and have the electricity just work, kids expect to walk into a space and just have the technology work. It's the same thing. Now, it's important to understand this generation because what I'm saying is that their expectations are different, but they're not necessarily different people. And I would be cautious and wary of any speaker or anyone who tells you that this generation is different than we are, that they're wired different, that they can multitask. They can do four things at the same time. No, they can't. They do four things poorly at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, we do too, right? I mean, the same, the same is true for us, right? If I see someone like typing on something, I stop talking because I know they can't do two things at the same time. I've seen the science. You can't multitask. You can only do one thing at a time. However, this generation thinks about learning in a different way than we do. This is a picture of my 13-year-old over Christmas break. He comes over, I'm sitting there watching football or the news or whatever it is, and he comes over and he shows me, um, he tells me that he's learning how to code in Java. He's teaching himself how to code in Java because he plays this game called Minecraft. <laughs> yes, the, the grunts of parents who know that their children are home right now playing Minecraft all day. <laughs> and he's playing this game called Minecraft and he doesn't like what the, some of the mods and what they do, so he has to build his own, so he needs to learn how to code so he can build his own mod, right? How they process things, how they think about learning is different. They're not waiting for anyone to teach them anything. They're going to learn it on their own. They're going to find things on their own. A couple of years ago, uh, we went on our family vacation to Hawaii for the first time. And my daughter, who's in Atlanta, doesn't like to fly. So I did what any good parent does. I bribed her and drugged her up. And said that when we get to Hawaii, we can buy you a ukulele because she wanted a ukulele. She, she's a musician. She's creative. She likes to play instruments. So we got off the plane, went right to the store, and bought her a ukulele. And I'm a pretty hip guy. So this is where I want you to come. This is the perspective I'm coming to you from. We're walking out of the store, and I notice out of the corner of my eye, instruction books and videos on how to play the ukulele. And I say to her, hey do you want to buy a book <laughs> or a video on how to play the ukulele? And she looked at me with such disdain, <laughs> like she didn't want to know me. She's like, what? Why? How is she going to learn how to play ukulele? Right. 
She's going to watch YouTube videos, and she's going to find 10 people that can teach her how to play one song, but somehow, for some reason, she's going to be able to connect with one of them somehow, and that's who's going to teach her how to play that song. And now she can play the ukulele. How they think about things is different than the way we think about things. How they learn is different than the way we learn. And here's the thing. We can take advantage of that, right? And instead, what we do in most of our school systems, we're just like, no, no, let's just, just shut that down. Let's shut down that curiosity and that learning. Let's not, let's not use technology. Let's not use the internet. Let's not use those devices. We're going we're gonna to teach you the old-fashioned way. They learn I mean, are thinking from things from a different perspective. A couple weeks after this photo was taken, he comes in to show me his line of code and wants me to QA it for him. And, and of course, I have no idea how to code in Java. Uh, so I, I pretend like I know what I'm doing. And I say, yeah, yeah, that looks good. And, and he's using this code. <laughs> but it got me thinking, are we letting kids reach their full potential? Are we letting them explore? And are we, even under the best circumstances, are we creating these boxes? Because the thing about Minecraft and gaming in general, because I, sp I spent a lot of time thinking about gaming, is that under the best circumstances, we are at the peak of gaming right now. For those of us who are gamers, and not even casual gamers, for those of us who grew up with Atari 2600, <laughs> remember Atari 2600? Remember when asteroids came out, you were so excited, and then you put the cartridge in, and it was just a bunch of blinking things on the thing. And you're like, oh, I can't wait till this gets better. And I can't wait till this gets better. And you kept saying that as a gamer. And now what do we have? We have PlayStation 4 with unbelievable AI and graphics and three dimensions and online and all these things. But the basic structure is the same, right? There's learning objectives. There's movements, right? You, you finish these things and you move on and you finish these things and you move on. So gaming is at the pinnacle, at the peak of what it can, what's possible. And what are kids saying with Minecraft? They're saying, nah, we don't like that. We want to build our own worlds. We want to create our own stuff. We want to work together to build things. We don't want anyone telling us what these things should look like. We'll, we'll make it ourselves. We'll come up with our own rules. And that's what Minecraft is showing us. And so, so we have to ask ourselves, even under the best learning circumstances, are we letting kids reach their full potential? And it made me think about this. And I was doing some research, and I found some really interesting things like, are we limiting potential because maybe the, the goals that kids have are pretty cool, right? Maybe, <laughs> maybe getting a girlfriend, <laughs> kissing her, and then ruling the world is a good objective. <laughs> or, you know, maybe the strongest force on earth is love. And of course, my favorite, oh, sorry, and or my favorite one is this one. Are, are we letting kids reach their potential? And what are we marking right and what are we marking as wrong, right? Those are the things that we have to think about because this generation of kids have a different expectation of what's possible. This generation of kids have a different expectation of what learning looks like. This generation of kids have a completely different view of what information looks like and what, how you process information. So these are critical things for us to think about. Now, what do we do with these kids and their potential and what's possible with them? Well, we definitely need to focus on certain skills. And for me, one of the first things I do is I try to talk to many students as I possibly can. I, I love talking to students. I'll, I'll, and if you have students, I'll do a hangout. I'll come in. I'll do Skype, whatever it is. I, I love talking to students, especially students who are growing up the way I grew up in a place like Hell's Kitchen. Because one, they need to see someone like me that if I can do this, and they can do this as well. I also talk to them about this idea that who they are and where they come from is competitive advantage. right? that their perspective, their views are going to be different at the table than anyone else's because of their circumstances and how they're, and their experiences like mine are today. But I also make sure that I don't ask them what they want to be when they grow up. I don't like that question. We've already established that there's a good chance that what they want to be when they grow up doesn't exist yet. And also, how do you explain 
to a kid in Hell's Kitchen what a biomedical engineer is. Instead, I asked them, what problem do you want to solve? What problem are you interested in? What spins in your head? I was in New York a couple months ago working or talking to the students of uh, Year Up, a program that's all around the country. And I was talking to the students, and they were there to hear from me, but I wanted to hear from them. And I was talking to the students, and they said, uh, you know, I, I said, hey, tell me who you are, where you live, and what problem you want to solve. And, they, and they're like, in the world? <laughs> yes, what problem do you want to solve? Because then we can challenge them. We can say, OK, now I want you to think about what knowledge, skills, and abilities do you think you need to solve that problem? Go research that. Go figure that out. What, what can you learn? Where can you learn it? What classes can you take? What can you take online? Who can you follow? Who, who can you follow on LinkedIn? Who can you follow on Twitter? What videos can you watch? What publications can you read? And so forth and so on. How can you educate yourself around the knowledge, skills, and abilities you need to solve the problem that you're interested in? And creating a generation of problem solvers is a lot more interesting to me than creating a generation of workers. I don't want to create a generation of workers. I want to create a generation of problem solvers because we got a lot of problems to solve. And so I talked to them about being problem solvers. And I love this picture because I was talking to a group of students and I asked them, you know, I asked them that question and all their hands went up because they want to talk about that. They want to figure that out. They want to figure out what problem they want to solve. And again, the problem doesn't have to be, you know, life changing, world changing, finding ways to bring clean water. It could be even how to make a car go faster, right? How to make a grocery shopping experience better, right? There are lots of problems. But the definition of how you do that is absolutely critical. So how do you build the knowledge, skills, and abilities to solve that problem? Because I can challenge students with that. I can say to them, the resources that you have at your fingertips are so different than they were for me, that you are having an advantage that I didn't have because you have all that information at your fingertips. We can take advantage of technology that way. I also talked to them about this idea of iteration. I don't like the word failure. We, use, we try to use the word failure. We need to teach our kids how to fail. One, again, this is my perspective, but a kid growing up in Hell's Kitchen doesn't need to know what failure, a definition of failure is, because I got a pretty good idea of what that looks like. Instead, and also I, I also think that the word failure has an opposite word, right? You either fail or you succeed. And that's not necessarily true, right? You iterate. You are continuously iterating. How many of you used Google last night? How many of you used it today? How many of you know that you probably used a different version of Google today than the one that you had last night? We update Google about 600 times a year. So about twice a day, you're using a different version of Google. For those of you who use Google Apps in your schools, and for those of you who are administrators of those accounts, you know that we update Google Apps about 200 plus times a year. This continuous iteration we have to build into our kids so that they're always iterating, they're always trying different things, they're always experimenting, that they're always learning, that they're always taking steps is absolutely critical. I also talked to them about this idea of collaboration. We use this word, we throw this word around a lot, but I don't think it means what you think it means. Right? Education is set up as an individual sport, but we live in a team-based world. You go to school, you do your homework, you do your reading, you take your test, and then you, you get your grades, you, get, you graduate, and then we say, all right, go work with others. Good luck. <laughs> and that's not the world we live in. Imagine as teachers, you hand out a test in seventh grade, typical test, and at the end of the test, two kids come up to you holding the test together. And they say, hey, we decided to combine our skill set and do this test together. <laughs> what would your reaction be? When did, when did collaboration become cheating? Now, spin that around or flip that around to me and imagine me going to Larry and Sergey and saying, here's the education plan. I did it all by myself. Nope, nobody helped me. The stakeholders, no, no, I didn't ask any stakeholders. I, I did it. Nobody helped me. 
No, my parents didn't help me. I did it all by myself. What would the reaction be? We live in a team-based world in everything that we do. Collaboration is more than just working together. Collaboration goes deeper than that. Collaboration is knowing that you are just creating part of a bigger solution and that you, whatever you create is only going to get better when someone else adds value to it. And this takes a lot of effort for us to get through because even I know most of you deal with it the same way I deal with it or dealt with it because now I'm much better at it. But this whole idea that someone says, hey, let me see your draft. You're like, oh, oh, oh it's not ready yet. No, no, when it's perfect, I'll share it with you. But that's not the world we live in. It's so much easier now in my world to just open up a Google Doc, start typing, share it with everyone else, and let everyone else add value to it. Collaboration is people working together to create one solution. Collaboration is this idea that we have to learn how to listen better and ask good questions. Collaboration is this idea that we want to make sure that we're focused on creating the best possible solution as a unit, as a group, than it is as, our indiv as an individual contributor. And we're not learning that in school because of the fact that we're, we're individual contributors, trying to put pieces together. And here's the other thing. Collaboration is the ability to change your mind. So we will sit at a table and listen to someone else's perspective and say, you know what, you're right, let's do that. And we're not teaching that in school, so we want to make sure that we're focused on collaboration. And then I talk to them about being digital leaders and not just digital citizens, because digital citizenship is the minimum requirement for this new economy. Knowing how to turn on a computer and using a browser and, and reading a website is the minimum requirement. We need digital leaders. What they post online, what they share online, what they create online is part of their digital portfolio. Who they collaborate, who they connect with, what their social media presence is. What, you know, if they're reading blogs, they should be writing blogs. If they're watching videos, they should be creating videos. I'm nervous that we're creating a generation of digital consumers and not digital leaders. And if they're not learning the skill set in school, where are they going to learn this? Right? They have to learn how to do this in school so that they can become digital leaders. So I talk to them about being digital leaders, not just consumers. Absolutely critical. Now, the good news is that we no longer, as educators, have to be the Google in the room. There used to be a time when that was important, like I said earlier, when we had information transfer facilities. Because if you asked me a question, like what happened on December 7th, 1941, and I didn't know the answer, I'd say, hang on, I'll be back in two days, I'm gonna go find out. And I had two choices, I can go find a book and look it up, or I can find someone and trust that they know what they're talking about and have them give me the answer. And today, that's no longer true. We have the information at our fingertips. I mean, even as parents, one of the benefit one of the perks I thought that I would have as a parent was the ability to make things up. <laughs> and that's no longer true. I'll say something that my kid just doubts, even for a microsecond, and he's like, eh, uh, Poppy, I don't know. Hang on, I don't know if that's true. Let me find out. <laughs> I'm being vetted by my 13-year-old every day. And so I, looking for other ways to get perks, have flipped that around on him. So when he comes to me and asks me a question that I know he can look up, my response is, um, I think you're mistaken. I work for the search engine. I'm not actually the search engine. <laughs> Go find out yourself. Go look it up. But then it's my responsibility to follow up. What did you find? Where did you find it? Did you vet it? Is it credible? How do you apply it? What would you do with it today? Does it make sense? All those questions that we can have as follow-up questions. Because our job in education is no longer to give credit to kids for something they can look up, but instead help them take that information and convert it into intelligence. 
couple months ago on President's Day, I saw one of those weird stats that said that 7% of Americans can name the first four presidents in order. 7%. Now think about that. We have 900 people or so in this room. I can call on any one of you and embarrass you and ask you to name me the first four presidents of the United States, and there's a 7% chance that some of you know. Or I could give all of you 30 seconds, and all of you can tell me who the first four presidents are. <laughs> so how valuable is that? So I went into my, my son's room and I said, so um, I just read that stat and I said, how, how many, uh, can you tell me who the first four presidents were? And he said, uh, yeah, uh, George Washington, Ben Franklin, uh, Abraham Lincoln, and Ronald Reagan. <laughs> so I said, okay. And I, gi I give them lots of assignments and drive them insane. But, so I said, okay, now you have to tell me who the first four presidents are and then tell me what their relationship was to each other. That's a different question. And so no longer giving credit for something they can look up is absolutely fundamental to what we have to do with new education. Instead, help them understand things. Help them create the desire to understand things deeply. That's what we have to do in education. And, and, and that's why it's an exciting time right now. Because there is no magic bullet to any of this. There's no magic solution to, to what we're looking for. We keep waiting for some magic thing to happen and it's not coming. Instead, what we have to do is continuously iterate what we're doing, continuously improve what we're doing, continuously focus on things. And I think there's three areas that we want to make sure we focus on. The first, are all these new learning models that are popping up everywhere, and I'm really excited about this. Whether it's project-based learning, inquiry-based learning, blended learning, hybrid blended learning models, flipped classrooms, all these cool things that are happening in education. Keep doing those things. This generation of teachers, you guys, are creating what these new learning models are going to look like for generations to come. And that's really exciting. So you have to experiment. You have to get in. You, ha you have to try all these new ways. You have to iterate what you're doing in your classrooms. And for those of you who are administrators, get out of their way. And let them try, let them experiment, let them put up some metrics, let's see what works, what doesn't work. How do we use technology? How do we not use technology? How do we improve what the learning models look like based around this new economy, based around these new ideas of what learning should look like and how do we do that? New learning models, really, really exciting things are going on, so we have to keep pushing those. And, I'm, and just over the last four years, I've seen some exciting things in this space across the globe. The second is this idea that the, the teacher is fundamentally the most important thing in a kid's life, especially a kid like me who, was growing, who grew up in House Kitchen. At the end of the day, when you clock that door, the teacher is the most important thing in a kid's life, again, especially for a kid like me. How do we make sure that you are building the right knowledge, skills, and abilities that you need so that you can support this new learning model that we're, these new learning models that we're creating? How do we make sure you have the right professional development, the right support, the right uh, collaborative environment for you to do this? Because this is not something that you can do on your own, but how do we make sure we do that? So un unbelievably important to keep building great teachers because at the end of the day, you know, I've met some really important people, some really influential people in my life. I play ping pong with Vince Cerf, who created the internet. But my fourth grade teacher, who taught me how to be creative, or my sixth grade teacher, who showed me worlds that I didn't know were possible, or my ninth grade teacher, who showed me math, when I thought I had no idea how to do math in a way that's always, that I've used that same model since ninth grade, which was like 150 years ago. A teacher is the most important thing in the room. And as a technologist, the idea and I hear this from teachers all the time, but the idea that technology is going to replace teachers is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Never going to happen. It's like saying that, you know, I work at Google, and it's like saying that, you know, the technology capital of the world, and, and like, I don't have a boss. I just use a computer. No, we have great bosses just like we have great teachers. We will always need great teachers in our classroom. We will always need people to push us. 
We always need people to show us different ways. We always have people to motivate us to do different things. And unbelievably important to have great teachers in the classroom. We have to make sure that teachers have the right knowledge, skills, and abilities. And conferences like this and opportunities like this for you to engage with each other and to learn different things, absolutely critical. And that's why I'm always excited with the energy that I find at these events. And of course, we need to invest in our future. You know, technology, one of my favorite teachers likes to say, we can't opt out of the 21st century, right? The idea that technology is a nice to have uh, or an option is, is still a little silly to me. We would never build a school and say, hey, let's, put, let's build a school, but we only have enough money to put electricity on the first and second floor, so we're not going to put electricity on the third and fourth floor. We'll, we'll, we'll see, we'll, we'll build that later. Broadband is the new electricity. Connectivity is the new electricity. Access to all the world's information is the new electricity, the new infrastructure. We would never build a school and, or have a classroom and say, oh, we can only put 10 desks in the classroom so 20 kids have to stand. Devices, access, those types of things are absolutely critical for this new world. Now, it doesn't mean that everyone has to have a device. It doesn't mean that everyone has to have an iPad or a Chromebook or any of those things. It means that we have to look at it as an essential part of what we're doing for our infrastructure. So we need to invest in that way. And again, lots of schools around the world are looking at this from that perspective, and that's exciting. Now, oops, this thing keeps slipping on me. So the important thing here to keep in mind is that this innovation and learning that we're doing isn't going to happen overnight. Anyone recognize what that is? <laughs> That's the original Google.com. That's it. That's what it looked like at the beginning. Larry and Sergey put a couple computers together, did distributed, distributed computing, and said, this is what it's going to look like. And today, this is what Google's computers look like. Now. What I want to point out is that this is not what Google looked like on Monday, and then this is what it looked like on Friday. This took 15 years of collaboration, problem solving, critical thinking, iteration. It took 15 years to get there, and we're nowhere near done. There is no, there's no end point. We're going to continuously do this continuously iterate. And that's what we need to do in education. And what we want to make sure is that we're not just taking a classroom, putting Wi-Fi in it, adding devices, and saying, oh, OK, now we're all modern. Because all we're doing then, and this is my biggest fear, is that we're just taking technology, laying it on top of our current processes, and making bad education faster and more efficient. I was talking to a college professor a couple months ago, and he said the whole idea, he loved MOOCs. And he said to me, as a college professor, I was, you know, I'm doing a MOOC, I'm doing a class. And before, as a college professor, I was only able to reach 50 kids a semester. Right? I, can talk, I can do a class for 50 kids a semester. Now, with a MOOC, I can reach 10,000 kids a semester. And I don't think he liked my response, because my response was, yeah, but what if you're a bad college professor? Before, you were only impacting 50 kids. <laughs> now you're ruining 10,000 kids. <laughs> we have to make sure that we're not using technology just to replace our current systems, that we're using it to innovate, that we're using it as a, as a baseline to innovate. Because at the end of the day, technology is not the silver bullet. It's not. Technology is there to enable and support great learning. And I always, I'm always careful when people ask me, so show me how technology improves learning. Because my response is, OK, I, I will as soon as you show me how desks improve learning, or textbooks, or chalkboards, or anything else that's a tool in our classroom. These are all tools that we use, enable and support. My job as a technologist is to make sure that the technology that we're building is easy to manage, it's easy to scale, it's easy to use, so that we get it out of the way. So that as teachers, you're not in there trying to figure out how to use our stuff, but instead just use it as part of the learning environment. It's our job as technologists. And I would tell you to challenge anyone who brings you technology 
that says, oh, it'll only take you like eight minutes a day to figure this out. No, don't say no. It has to be easy, it has to be transparent, it has to be easy to use, easy to manage, easy to scale so that we can, you can be flexible with it. That's our job in technology because technology is not the silver bullet. It's there to enable and support what great learning looks like. Now what's really exciting about this is that we're just getting started. We're at the very beginning. The web is 25 years old. These new learning models are a couple years old. Really exciting time to be in education because of what's happening in this space. You guys are creating what that future of learning looks like. We're just getting started. So it's okay to be patient and understand that we're not going to look for some magic solution, that we just start innovating and we start iterating what learning looks like from today, and that's all we need to do. Keep asking those critical questions. And I want to leave you with this closing thought. I want you to think about a five-year-old, any five-year-old, and then I want you to look at whatever technology you have, whether it's your smartphone, your tablet, your new MacBook Pro, your iPad, your Chromebook, whatever technology you have. Then I want you to picture that five-year-old, and I want you to realize that that technology that you have in your hand is the worst technology that that five-year-old will ever see in their life. It's their Commodore 64. <laughs> they're gonna, in 20 years, they're going to find your device in the 50 cent box at the thrift store. <laughs> and they're going to be with their friends and they're going to like, oh, I'm, oh, I have to buy this. My dad had this. <laughs> look, how, look how heavy it is and how thick it is. Look, it doesn't even bend or anything. And then they're going to remember, and they're going to reminisce, and they're going to laugh for a very long time. And they're going to say, oh, I, you know what I remember? I remember he used to have to charge this thing every day. Because it wouldn't even last all day long. Those are the five-year-olds that are coming into our school system next year, or this fall. Are we ready for them? Are we ready for their expectations? Are we going to change what our learning models look like so that we can meet their expectations? Is it possible to create a learning environment and create a learning space that's relevant, engaging, that helps them identify the problems that they want to solve, that helps them iterate and collaborate and work together and enjoy that learning experience from the time that they're five years old so that we create those global citizens, those lifelong learners that we need for the next generation. Thank you very much.